Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Good morning. How are you? All right. Let me try that again. Good morning. How are you? Man, it's good to be here this morning. I want to welcome our Facebook crowd this morning. I know some of you are joining us live on Facebook and our eText. If you don't know, we're on eText every week on Mondays and Thursdays so that you can watch our broadcast. And so we're excited you guys are joining us, but I'm excited you're here this morning. And uh, I don't know about you, but over the last few years, probably the last year, and especially during the World Cup soccer, anybody soccer fans in here? In here? They call that football over in Europe. It's soccer, okay? And so this is football. What star Cowboys play tonight. Amen? Anybody excited about that? Uh, I know it's not spiritual, but it is. Um, it is spiritual. But here, here's what I've noticed over the last year, um, especially during the World Cup soccer. There was this thing called 23 and Me. Did you, y'all, y'all see that commercial, 23 and Me? It's on Ancestry. It seems like every commercial that came on was about Ancestry. And I've, I've heard more about genetic Ancestry and Ancestry in general than I've probably ever heard in my entire life. In fact, Danielle tells a story that her grandmother was into uh, uh, genealogy and, and she would drive to uh, these cemeteries and she would record names and record dates of births and deaths. And that's where Danielle learned to drive is in the cemetery. And so couldn't hurt anybody, right? And so it wasn't a bad place. But I got to be honest with you, I've never had a desire to know more about my roots. I know what I've done and I know what my grandfather did. I don't want to know anymore. Can I get an amen? It would scare me to go deeper than that. You know, I mean, and maybe you had a great grandfather and everything was wonderful and you want to get back to the bad stuff. But I'm telling you, I don't want to search any further than than, than like one generation for me. You know, Uh, I know some of you are deeply entrenched in that. You you love it. You research it. And in fact, you stayed up all night last night on Ancestry.com. You were doing research last night. And and, uh, so if you're going to sleep this morning, we're going to call you out for doing genealogy all night. Okay. Uh, In fact, I, I was doing some research this last week that 23 and me has over 5 million customers. And here's what's interesting. Here, this is very interesting to me. Uh, that, that they say that 23 and me, the United States, is their number one customer base, followed by Canada and the United Kingdom. I thought that was interesting that in modern Western um, countries that people are trying to figure out who they are. In fact, a a psychotherapist, Mel Swartz, says this, there is a desire to understand our culture, our cultural heritage, because we live in a culture culture which is sorely lacking that and unable to provide us that context. Listen to what he says. Everything is changing so fast. Moment to moment, everything changes so that the counterbalance to that is the stability. Where did I come from? Where did my great-great-grandparents come from? It's the balance to the volatility and the fast moving pace of this world, he says, that drives people to know and to desire, where do I come from? But yet I think it's a deeper issue. As I was reading this Swartz guy this last week, I I think there's this desperate desire in our culture today, and I think specifically in a Western culture, but I think it's I think it's universal, super cultural as well, that there is something in all of us that there's there's something hankering in us to belong. That's why we try our own identities online. That's why we do some of the things we do is because we've lost something in culture that we have promoted so much individualism and independence that we have forgotten that there's something connected in humanity. 
In fact, uh, Andy Kill says this, people take the test of 23andMe, he's, the, he's one of the executives of 23andMe, he says people take the test for a variety of reasons, both health and ancestry related. Some don't know their family background, they wanna learn where in the world their DNA is from, and some have a general idea about their heritage, but they're looking to fill in the gaps, because something's missing in our world. Even some religions practice the baptism of the dead or, or proxy baptism, if you've ever heard of that. It's the Mormon church. Is that the Mormon church believes that according to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15 that Paul was talking about the resurrection of Christ Jesus. And he's using an illustration in that where he was talking about if Jesus doesn't raise from the dead, then what are those who are baptizing for the dead gonna do? And he was using it as an illustration. So the Mormons took that one thing out of context and they developed this whole thing of proxy of baptism. And, and guess where Ancestry.com was founded? In Utah right across the street from the Mormon temple, owned by a Mormon, started by a Mormon, now owned by a Fortune 500 company. You see, there's something in this that I think in America and our culture today, the reason we're so interested in knowing where we come from is because there's a loneliness in our culture. That depression is on the rise, especially among millennials, because life has not turned out like they thought it was gonna turn out and they thought they would have a job the moment they graduated and then they graduated and they're still living in mom and dad's house, still trying to figure it out. And that coincides in the consequence of lacking a strong social connection, which is supposed to be family in the church. In fact, psychotherapist Natalie Theodore says this, as society, our dependence on technology has deeply affected the quality of our relationships as a result of this loneliness and wanting to belong, we're turning to technology. And yet she goes on to say, but the relationships we make online are often superficial. And what's more, our in-person relationships, she says, also suffers because of our time we spend glued to our phones and other devices. You see, I think we live in a generation that needs connectedness more than ever. And our lonely generation has difficulty understanding the comp concepts that we're all interconnected because over the last 30 to 40 years, there's this strong message of being independent and personal. And you would think, you would think the church would be a place where people would feel connected, wouldn't you? But sadly, it's not. In fact, Webster's Dictionary defines involved, this word that we're to be involved with one another. It, it, it has this idea that we're to draw in as a participant, to relate closely, to connect, to include, so that when we're involved in each other's lives, there's this idea that we connect with them, that we think of them as we make plans. We actually operate our lives around others in clear focus about what they're thinking. We draw them into our activities because we're involved with them. As believers in Christ, there's, there's really four areas of involvement to mention, and I only mention these areas because it can seem overwhelming at times to go, you need to be involved. You're like, where else can I connect? I'm already busy, right? You see, there's four areas as believers that we, we manage involvement. I remember one is our involvement with God. And the result of our involvement with God and God's involvement with us led to our salvation for those of us that have a relationship with Jesus. I realize not everybody has a relationship with Jesus in this room or, or maybe you're watching and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. But listen, God pursues you. He pursued us. And because of his pursuit of us through Jesus Christ, we now are involved with God that we maintain a close relationship or should maintain a close relationship with him. The single most important relationship that we should be involved in should be our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But it's not automatic, is it? Because you see, there are two parts to our involvement with God. One is that he is Christ and two, he is Lord. One is how he pleases us. He is our Christ, it's, it's his promises. And we love to talk about the promises of Christ. It's what I get, amen? But see, there's another part of being involved with God, it's how I please him, it's our obedience. It's what I get to give. You see, in any relationship, there's two parts. It's what you get and what you give. And that's the part of following Jesus Christ. Following Jesus is not about all what you get. And over the last 25 to 30, maybe 40 years, we've reduced down to the Christ, but we have forgotten the Lordship. 
Because see, in Christ Jesus, we get something. But in Christ Jesus, we also give something once we receive him as our savior. So we're involved in our relationship with God. But number two, we're involved in our families, our parents, our children, our relatives, our spouses. We include them in our thinking, or we should. (laughs) Our living, our planning, some more closely than others. I know that all of us have. Maybe you've done the genealogy search and there's some you don't want to include in your thinking, amen? Okay, don't look at your spouse (laughs) or kids. See, we have involvement with God and we have involvement with others, but we also have involvement with other Christians. And usually these are chosen from this group right here where you're sitting. And it's hard to connect with other Christians if all you do is technology. There's something special about gathering here. I was talking to Danielle just a couple of weeks ago and since we started Facebook and live and she, live and, boy, that's a great statement, isn't it? Since we started Facebook live, uh, she will sometimes not come until the 11 o'clock service and she'll get here and go, man, that was a great message. And I'm like, what? I was talking to Jake about it this last week, and, and every time I'm on vacation or I miss a Sunday, I usually try to tune in on Vimeo and, and go watch whoever preached or whoever was on the stage that week, and, and I'll hear people say, man, that was a phenomenal service, and yet sometimes when I watch it by myself, there's something missing because there's something about being involved here. There's something about being in the collective gathering of God's people. And you know, what's you, you, interesting is that the number grows that we're connected to as these areas of mutual interest. We find out, oh, you like fishing? Man, I love fishing. And all of a sudden there's a connection. Oh, you like golf? Oh, I love golf. Oh, oh you like crochet? That's for women. Um, it, you know, you, you, there's a connection as that grows. Now, if you're a dude and you like crochet, that's fine. Don't tell anybody, okay? Um, but see, the fourth area of involvement is our involvement with non-Christians. And these are the people that we work with we do business with, that you, you, you are going to restaurants with and you're around them and, and, and we're usually entertained by them. And, and yet today, here's what I wanna focus on as we think about this connected, that there's more to do at Summit than just sit in this chair. I wanna focus on our involvement with each other, that God actually designed us for each other. In fact, a psychologist attempted to describe the relationship of Christians with one another. Maybe you've heard this before, but I stumbled on this a couple of weeks ago again, and I thought it was funny because he describes um, that that he compared Christians and churches to a group of porcupines on a cold night. You ever heard this story? That the cold drives them together and they get close and they huddle up to keep warm. But as soon as they get close, those quills begin to prick each other and they run apart. And when it gets cold again, they come back together And then they begin to prick each other and they move apart. And and, and so they're constantly coming together and they irritate each other and then they move apart and they come together and they irritate each other and they move apart. And he says, the church is a lot like a group of porcupines (laughs) that we need each other, but we just keep poking each other. And then we have to move away from each other, you know? It's kind of funny when we think about it that for many of us, we're gonna spend eternity with people that we don't even like. (laughs) <laughs> Some of you are like, oh, wait a minute. But the, frankly, is, is that we need each other, needles and all. Amen. You know, throughout history, no church has probably better modeled involvement than the Acts church. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, we, we find where Peter preached this sermon and, and 3,000 people were added. Isn't that incredible? And here's what's incredible. They had no pastor. They had no bylaws. They had no set values. They had no mission statement. Everything that they tell you how to grow a church today, they didn't have a building, a sanctuary. They didn't have, and they didn't even have a complete Bible. The New Testament hadn't even put together yet. And yet 3,000 people, how would you like to have 3,000 people added in one day? I would, I think. (laughs) And yet the members of this new congregation, if you go back and you read in Acts chapter 2, we're more deeply involved with each other's life than any other church that's probably ever existed. Even with the hindsight of 2000 years and all the books and all the church growth books I've read, probably, I don't even wanna tell you how many church growth books I've read over the years, but I'm telling you, there's no other group in history like the first church in Acts that were so involved with each other. In fact, I want you to look at it in Acts chapter four because this is so incredible. Look what it says. It says, all the believers were one in heart and mind and no one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. In verse 33, 
with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully work in them all. And then in verse 34, it says that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money to, uh, from the sales, and they put it all at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Isn't that amazing? I mean, think about that. These early group of believers had such a strong connection that they were willing to fellowship together, be involved with each other, that if anybody had a need, they'd go sell a piece of land and just go lay it at the feet of the apostles. Man, and that's some fellowship right there, isn't it? That's a fellowship. We won't even loan our cars, will we? Uh, yeah, no, not you. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. You know, that Greek term for fellowship in the New Testament, it's called koinonia. It's a, it's a Greek word that really, it's, it's the word that has a root meaning of called common. And so they were drawn together. This early group of people, they had a common commitment to Christ that, that everything that they centered on and their commonality, if I can use that word, was Jesus Christ. And it started with Jesus, it's gonna end with Jesus. And even today is still about Jesus, that there was a common commitment to Christ. But there was also a common possession of the people that, that everything they had, that at a moment, if they saw a need, they would go meet that need. If that meant they sold a piece of land or, or they sold a camel or they sold a donkey or they sold a car, they didn't have cars. Okay, don't go looking for that. But there was a common possession, but there's also a common suffering that caused this early group of believers to come together in such a way to be involved with each other in such a way that I don't know that we've seen since. So we might define this fellowship as genuine Christianity freely shared among God's people, his family members, that we're involved with one another. You know, God created us for involvement, not isolation. He shaped us together to fit together as that passage we read just a while ago that we're fixing to read again that he created us to fit into relationship with one another. But through the fall, when Adam and Eve took a bite of that apple and sin entered the world, it was bent out of shape and sin entered the world, leaving us fighting against that closeness to Jesus or straining to connect with him and the people around us. That from that day forward, there's been this whole fight against, I know I want to be with God, but I don't want to be with God. I want to be with God, but I want to, I want to believe in God, but I'm not sure there's a God because there was a guy like you that sat on the stage like you that said something stupid. It hurt me, and I'm just not sure there's a God or this whole idea of just straining and trying, and it just seems like it never comes together. Thankfully, Christ came. Thankfully, Jesus came, and he became man, and he walked among us. And he came to demonstrate to us how to live in community, flaws and all, jacked up and all, sin and all, as we learned last week. And by the way, if you missed last week, you missed one of the most powerful services of restoration and recovery. You see, Jesus came to exercise love and grace and teach us mutual encouragement. And that koinonia is never, that, that connectedness is never to be done alone. You see, God's desires that his sons and daughters be personally and deeply involved in each other's lives. We see in Acts chapter four, there were no porcupines there. That when they came together, they, they, they weren't running apart and coming together. No, they were together. And when there was a need, they met that need. And I know some of you are right now going, yeah, but Edward, I'm telling you, it's personal for me. I don't need anybody else. And, and listen, somewhere back in the last 35, 40, maybe 50, 60, 70 years, somewhere has crept into Christianity that Christianity is a personal relationship with God. And it is, don't miss that. But listen to me, the personal part is where Jesus saves you. But that's the only thing personal about it from that day forward. From that day forward, God created us to be connected. And so for some of us, we come into this room and go, listen, man, listen, man, it really just comes down to me and God, we got this deal. Listen, the only deal God made is Jesus. Can I just tell you that? It's not being good. It's not sitting in church. The only deal God has made is through Jesus Christ and us making him the Lord and Christ of our life. And then from that point, 
It's about us being involved. In fact, uh, Paul writes about this in his letters to Rome and, and Corinth, and he provided us some uh, two incredible insights. I want you to see it. Look at Romans 12, verses 9 through 16. You see, I think God commands involvement. You might write that down. God commands involvement. Listen, we know he's our Christ. He promised all these things. He's going to save us, love us, never forsake us, always going to love us, always going to forgive us, past, present, future, all that. But listen, on this side of the, he is our Lord, and so he gives us commands to follow. And in Romans chapter 12, from the Living Bible, I've chose that because I love the way it reads. Look at it. It says, don't just pretend. Everybody say pretend. Yeah. Don't pretend that you love others. Really love them. <laughs> I love that. Hate what is wrong. Stand on the side of good. Love each other with brotherly affection and take delight in honoring. Say everybody say honoring. Honoring each other. Never be lazy in your work. <clears throat> Don't punch anybody. Never be lazy in your work, but serve the Lord enthusiastically. Be glad for all God is planning for you. Be patient in trouble and prayer for always. When God's children are in need, you be the one to help them out. And get into the habit of inviting guests home for dinner or if they need lodging for the night. If someone mistreats you because you're a Christian, don't curse him. Pray God a blessing. When others are happy, be happy with them. If they're sad, share in their sorrow. Work happily together. Don't try to act big. Don't try to get into the good graces of important people, but enjoy the company of just ordinary folks. Amen? Yeah, amen. Don't think you know it all. Right. Don't you love that translation? Yeah, I just love that. It's amazing to me. The problem is the devil's strategy is working, isn't it? Because we pretend to love others, but there's no action. There's no sacrifice. We just come and sat in chairs, did my duty, but there's no sacrifice, or at least if there is, it's the bare minimum. We're not gonna adjust our life around our plans and all those things around being connected to God. We don't honor others in our culture. You know what? We wanna honor ourselves, don't we? Is that too close? Too close to home? We don't serve. And, and, and hey, that whole thing about inviting people to spend the night, uh, no, <laughs> no. That's getting a little too personal. Blessing those who curse me, ah, uh, I'm out. You see, I think the enemy has de deceived us. It's deceived us to think that church is just a chair. It's just a place we come and sit. That we really shouldn't be concerned about our brother's keeper. And by the way, it's none of their business, right? And I don't want people butting into my business, so I'm not gonna butt into their business. Yet we do, and we don't, right? See, I would tell you, don't be fooled by everybody's veneer in this room this morning. Some of you look really good, okay? Some of you, all right? I'm not gonna say all of you. But some of you look really good this morning because your veneer looks good. You see, don't be fooled by that. Because some of us in this room, our vases are beautiful. Our outside is beautiful, but inside, some of us have never let anybody see what's really going on. They've never let them see. In fact, in Genesis chapter two, just before God gave Adam Eve, y'all remember when God created the earth and, and then he created Adam and Adam named all the animals and Adam was flourishing and, and God was looking down and they were meeting together and God realized something. In Genesis 2, 18, here's what God said. It is not good for man to be alone. Isn't that amazing? It's not good to be alone. God did not create us to be alone. When God looked down and realized that Adam needed more, Adam needed that horizontal connection, that God created Eve and, and brought them together. See, that brings us to the second reason. Not only does God command for us to be involved, to be a part of the body, but the body needs involvement. Look at 1 Corinthians 12. It says, as it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the hand can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ 
And each one of you is a part of it. Listen, in order to be the body of Christ, the church, to do it, to do its thing, we've got to realize that God created us for a connectedness. That there's a team involved here. That we're all apart. See, listen, when the body is functioning and, and involved with each other, connected with each other, there's, it drives away division. There's not a place for the enemy to come in and drive a wedge of division in the body because the body is functioning and involved with each other, realizing that every part is depending upon the other one so that no one part can come along and bring division in. It keeps down diseases when all the parts of the body are working together that the enemy can't come in and plant the diseases of bitterness and, and gossip and anger and all those things because the body is functioning together. That when the body is broken, it mends fractures to bring those in. That when there is those places where the body is attacked, that when the body is functioning together, it mends those fractures. It accelerates healing because we are together to be involved with one another. That there's an interdependence in the body. Just as the human body comes to the aid of its injured parts, we're commanded to assist each other as servants and friends through being involved with each other. In the family of God, there's no such thing as a completely independent member of the body. I've had friends through the years just give up on church, give up on the gathering like this. I can just worship God in my living room and you can. But you'll find out over time, and, and here's the interesting thing, For over time, those guys who have told me that, who I became great friends with, it's always amazing when the end comes, you know who they call? The church. To pray over them. To do their funerals. To do the last rites. See, you can function alone for a while, but understand you were created for this. To be involved with one another. Now let's go back to verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 12. And I want to point out three things about involvement this morning. Number one, it's in verse 25. It says, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its part should, notice that word should, have equal concern for each other. Notice that God used that word should, not must, or you better. Because there's something spontaneous about being involved, isn't there? There's something spontaneous that that word should kind of implies spontaneity. That when God prompts involvement, it's spontaneous. It's not contrived. It's not forced. It just flows. That when God is at work somewhere, there's something about us that goes, I want to be a part of that. I want to be there. There's no legislation. There's no obligation. We just do it because we want to. Listen, when God's at work and God's doing something incredible, it, no one has to come along beside you and go, you better do this. Because we've been there, hadn't we? And I don't know about you, at nearly 50 years old, I'm like a 13-year-old image of myself. When somebody tells me I should or I have to, there's something in me that rises up and goes, really? Maybe I'm the only one that's rebellious. See, there's an involvement that should be voluntary, spontaneous, not mandatory or contrived. People have the freedom to get involved with what God's doing. I loved when Henry Blackaby wrote years ago, Look around and see where God's at work and then join him in it. Isn't that good? Just look around and see where God's at work and then just jump in the middle of that. I think we spend so much time going, what's God's will, God, what's God's will, what's God's will, what's God's will, and all along God's at work and we just join him in it and it's spontaneous. But it kind of brings us to the second because being involved also means there's a vulnerability in being involved. Look at verse 26, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. This is where ministry gets messy. This is where the porcupines come together, isn't it? It's when we wanna celebrate with each other, but you want us to suffer with each other? Because <laughs> see, involvement is emotional, isn't it? It's personal, it's human. It brings about the capacity to be wounded. And see, I know some of you were wounded years ago and it's taken you years to take a risk to be here. And some of you have found a safe place here at Summit to, to kind of investigate the claims of Christ, but also just kind of come back home to be with the Lord. And there's a safety in this place because there is this idea that when you're vulnerable, you can be wounded or you're open to attack and people will be misunderstood or you'll be misunderstood or damage will be done. In other words, there's a vulnerability 
Because see, when wounded people enter in, listen to me, church, look at me, believers, look at me, super saints. When people who walk through these doors are wounded, their wounds ooze. (laughs) I don't do blood. I don't do ooze. There's something in the spiritual sense that vulnerable people get messy. And we get involved in that and we help them heal. But listen, we can't truly be involved with others if we don't open up ourselves. You see, last week was such a beautiful picture because vulnerability has two parts. We must be willing to get involved in vulnerable people, but we must become vulnerable people. Think hospital spa here. This teaching that we've done for the last couple of years, this is both a hospital and a spa. This is both a place where the wounded come and find healing. This is also a place where the, the, the healed get in shape. Both Christ and Lord. What he promises and what I get to do. That we work our spiritual muscles out. One of the most intimate stories of vulnerability we find in Mark chapter 14 of a lady named Mary who brings this full vase, this beautiful vase full of this expensive perfume. Look at it. While he was in Bethany talking about Jesus, he was reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper. Get that. He's hanging out with leprosy. (laughs) Isn't that good? (laughs) A woman came with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume made a pure nard and she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. She comes in, this lady, she comes in with this beautiful jar of milky white vein, smooth perfume. And she does something incredible. She goes over to Jesus and she breaks it over him, pouring it all out, everything she had all over the Savior Jesus. And the whole house was the fragrance of Jesus. The fragrance of this perfume was all through the house. Do you know people come into this place every week and their veneer, their vase is so beautiful and so incredible. They're contained and self-sufficient. And that's why we go in and go, boy, you look pretty today. Man, that dress looks good on you. Man, your hair looks great. And wow, have you lost weight? Because we're admiring the vases and we never get to what's inside. There's no perfume emitting. So every once in a while, there's that dude, that girl that walks in, and man, the perfume precedes her, precedes him. And you know there's something there. Listen, exteriors are sometimes just like vases. They're breakable. See, Mary broke her vase, shocking, controversial. The disciples were like, (gasps) number one, what's she doing here? And number two, do you know how much, you know how many people we could feed with that? He went, he's lost it. I mean, this wasn't a vase breaking party. There wasn't an invitation to say, bring your vases. We're going to break them tonight over Jesus. It wasn't like that. She did it all by herself. Jesus didn't ask her to. It was something spontaneous. There was something vulnerable. That She was anointing him. That she was giving herself everything she had to him. Amen. And it was risky. It was worth it. You see, involvement is spontaneous, it's vulnerable, but it's also accountable. Look at verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. Everybody look at me. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, even if you're not, fake it, okay? Look at me. This isn't something that God's calling me to do. This is something he's calling us to do. That we are responsible. A few weeks ago, I preached a message about the holy man myth, the holy place myth. And some of us have bought into that, that you think you hired us to do your job. That is not the case. He is calling us to be a part. We're a part of one big, massive body, not just individuals, but individuals who carry out vital functions of the body of Christ. Therefore, we're accountable to each other. In a world where there's more connectivity than ever before, yet there's also more mental illness than ever before, more loneliness than ever before. It's a comfort that God has called us to be the body, to be involved with one another, to care for one another, to be interested in one another, to to notice one another, to build up one another. No nameless faces in the crowd. 
See, that's why we push for small groups because we know that in a small group, a first impressions team, that group of people that gets here early and meet, they're meeting in a small group because they are noticing one another. They are interested in one another. They are caring for one another that your preschool volunteer team, your re-engage group, your small groups on Wednesday night, this worship team on Sunday morning is in a small group. That The reason we push for that is because God created us to be involved with one another. In a church this size, it is so easy to get lost in the shuffle. It's so easy. I find it hard to believe that there are people that walk into this place because I'm partial to y'all. I love y'all. I think you're the best church in East Texas. I'm going to be honest with you. If you're watching with us, you need to come visit with us because you're missing something because there's something special about this place. Amen? I'm telling you. Listen to me. I find it hard to believe that in this audience, there's some people in this room that are uninvolved, that their vases are intact because they're scared to death to be vulnerable. There's people sitting here this morning, listen to me, church. There's people sitting here this morning that need you. They need you. The days of the senior pastor standing at the front door shaking everybody's hand. Y'all remember those? Well, I can't be at four places at once. We have four exits in this building, amen? So guess what? You're the body. Not only do they need you, can I just say this to you? You need them. Yes. <laughs> you need them. Listen, isolation is an incredible killer. And if the enemy can isolate you, he can pick you off. If he can isolate your marriage, he'll pick you off. He'll isolate your marriage and tell you, you don't need re-engage. You don't have time to go to re-engage. You can't afford re-engage. Listen, all he's doing is isolating you to making you think that you can figure this out when all along what God says, we're the body of Christ. Get involved with each other because not only do they need it, you need it. You see, involvement and busyness aren't necessarily the same thing. I think some of us have mistaken, I'm just so busy. I'm just so involved. See, I grew up Southern Baptist, and the old rumor was back in the day that Texas had the best roads in, in, in all of the United States, and the Baptists did their best to tear them up going to church every night. Y'all remember that? I'm not picking on Baptists. Please don't be offended. I grew up. I love my heritage. I'm recovering Baptist. Hi, Mom. Um, listen to me. Being busy and being involved are two different things. Being busy and being involved are two different things. Just because you have a full schedule doesn't mean you're involved. You might be involved in a lot of good things, but not involved in the things that God wants you to be involved, in, and that's the body. Hello? Parents, listen to me. Our children, just because they're busy doesn't mean they're involved. And we're pushing a whole generation to be busy, but not be involved. There's a big difference. So here's two questions in closing. I'm gonna let you go home. How many people in your life do you really know? And how many people in your life really know you? Your dreams, your struggles, your fears, areas of your life where accountability needs to be there. And how are you gonna do that this week? I'm just asking you to do that with somebody this week, to be involved, to be involved. How many people in your life really know you and you really know them? Let me pray for you. So Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you that um, you created us for something so much bigger than just sitting in a chair. You created us for something so much bigger than just gathering one day a week. God, you created us to save us, to be in a relationship with you through Jesus. And then God, to be on mission, to go out and love people and to love each other, to be involved with each other. And God, I realize there's some people in this room that may be listening today on, online or maybe listening on Facebook or maybe you're listening in this room that God, they, they've never surrendered their life to you. They're not involved with you. They've never come to that place where they've realized they're a sinner and that sin separates them from you. And God, today what they need to do is surrender their life to you. They need to confess you as the Lord Jesus Christ of their life. And God, your word says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that you will save us. So God, I pray if there's somebody sitting here listening online, that God, they don't have a relationship with you, that today they would admit they're a sinner 
And God, they would invite you to be the Lord of their life, asking, them to, asking you to forgive them of their sin. And God, today you would give them a new heart, a heart of flesh. And God, you'd change them. God, give us the courage in this room for those of us that have a relationship with Jesus to walk out of here, to be involved in people, to be involved in the body, either through small groups, maybe in service, as we're gonna talk about next week, that God, we would be involved in the greater body to mourn with those who mourn, to celebrate with those who celebrate, that not just try to jockey for position, but God, to really love each other and not pretend. So God, give us courage. I know for some of us, we're going to rearrange our schedules for that to happen. So give us courage today. Give us courage this week. I love you. Thank you for Jesus. And we ask it in his name. And everybody said, amen. amen. I love you. Have a great week. I'll see you next week. Amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.